Storyworthy Media, the best in story-driven content. Hey, it's Marco Black, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Finney. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn and I'm here with Hannah Finney and we're at the Belasco Theater from the musical Gypsy. Where the hell is that? Well, it's a fictional theater that used to exist many, many years ago. It was a burlesque theater. But the musical Gypsy is all about the ultimate stage mom. I see. And of so we'll, Gypsy Rose Lee. I see. So we're giving our I'm audience... I'm not gay. We're giving our audience a double whammy of not only are we not really here, but in fact, it's we're not even a, anyway. We're not even in a place that actually exists. And it, if this is too much for people, if it blows their minds, <laughs> hey, man. You know, I get, I get messages. I'd say one or two a month of people talking to me about, you know, I know you guys were in Wisconsin last week, or I heard you were in Florida, because they believe it. How, how, how can that be still happening after five years? It's my pure strength it's your delivery it's my delivery my belief it you know as george costanza once said on seinfeld remember it's not a lie if you believe it okay you guys so the reason why we're coming from the gypsy theater or whatever the hell hannes is talking about the blasco because our storyteller tonight margot black she's a comedian and a writer and a pr guru and she is bringing forth the topic stage mom stage mom and i know she has a child because he's my daughter's age and they're friends Exactly. So yeah. she, this story must be about right. her with her child doing something Right, and even though it takes place in Hollywood, it's stage bomb. They're all stage bombs, whether there's a stage involved or a, or a camera or recording. Have you ever seen that show Dance Moms? I have been forced to watch that uh, on my lunch, and it is fucking horrifying. It's truly unbelievable. It's, 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 it's like the kind of thing where you're like, maybe America should just collapse in and on itself. Yeah. If this is what we're producing, this yeah. is the worst behavior I've ever seen in my life. And it just, and wi- it's only girls slash women who watch it, but it makes women look horrible. Mm-hmm. You know, all the stereotypes that misogynist men would have about women are bitchy and they're, and they're cunty and they're, and they're mean to each other and they're, and they're just concerned about, you know, you know, money. And, and f- it's like every horrible stereotype of women In one show. There's not one redeeming quality to anyone on it. And there's no man anywhere in sight. This, of course, is the way the producers have set it up. Oh, absolutely. Or do you think it really... I mean, it is this way to an extent. It it is that way to an extent. You couldn't get a normal human being to act like this. Yeah. They have to be want to be on TV so bad well, that it's they're willing to act like a horrible human being. Right. It's interesting. Which just makes them a horrible human being, so it's self-fulfilling prophecy. It's interesting out here in Los Angeles. I've done a lot of commercials, and I've always, I'm always playing like casual mom, pretty but average, because yeah. I'm very average. And so, uh, but I'm always the mom. So when I became a mom, I thought, well, shit, man. Now the, the jobs are going to come flying. I'm going to be working like crazy because I'm a mom. It shows. And I, w- I would take my daughter on auditions with me, and we did book one spot together. Now, she was a baby. She's yeah. like seven Literally months old, a babe. 10 months old, yeah. 12 months old. So she doesn't even know what's going on. Uh, so I can't really be a stage mom in that she it's a baby. I'm dealing with a baby. But we did get cast in this spot for the Discovery Channel. It was just a commercial, like a promo for them. And it was basically mom, dad, baby. The baby walks from the mom to the dad, toddling, and falls into the father's arms. That's the whole spot. Right. It's nothing. Not- and the day before we're supposed to shoot, uh, I get the, I get a call from like, production coordinator somebody i don't know who casting i don't know and <laughs> they just some I don't know, who fucking knows <laughs> and they say hey christine we have a problem the husband that we cast for you can't do the spot anymore yeah do you have a husband and i'm looking down the other end of the desk my <laughs> husband and i had a desk that we shared and we would you know chairs that were beside one another and i looked down at him and I'm, I'm like yes in fact i do have a husband and they said well maybe you could send his picture over and you know does he have a beard yes he does is he willing to shave okay hold on let me ask him you know and i'm holding the phone matt check this out they're asking if you'll be in the commercial me you and alabama so all of us are going to make money 
All of us are going to get paid. This is fantastic. Will you shave? Of course you're going to shave, right? And he goes, well, I don't know if I really want to do it. You know, and, and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I go on 50 auditions to get one job. Yeah. And he goes, well, who's working on it? He wants to know who's on the set. Right. Now, now, uh, what I need to point out to the, first of all, normal people are like, well, of course he doesn't want to shave. Everybody in Hollywood is like, of course you shave. You shave your head, whatever. But he's not an actor. No, he's not he an actor. He did comedy, but he's he's a crew guy. He's a director. And that's why So he, he doesn't have the mentality right. of... Of when they say to you in an audition, I've had this. You know, will you shave? You say yes. You just say yes. You just do. Can you ride yes. a horse? Yes. Yes. Do you roll? Will a you blade? shave a horse? Yes. <laughs> so it's like you know he doesn't have that mentality, right? So, and so he wants to know who's working on set because he thinks if they see him, you know, doing a commercial, they're going to make fun of him. Yeah. So I'm like Matt. Yeah, we're doing it. Yeah. And we did do the commercial, and it is adorable. And he did not shave. If and I recall. he did not. No, he did shit. Wait. I think he did shave. I saw a still from this. I'm pretty sure he You're had- right. He didn't shave. Yeah. The point is, uh, we all got paid, and now my daughter has a Coogan account, and uh, <laughs> I think she's in SAG. I don't know. The uh, Yeah, it's funny because I'll see, like, like you know, various actor friends what on Facebook, whatever the category of friend that is, and it'll be like, this woman is like, I'm going in with my daughter. I'm so excited. And it's like, we made callbacks. And then she'll be like, my daughter got picked. I didn't That's with right. a different mom. So they'll have people, you know, and you, you think to yourself, yeah, you'll have this actor couple with their actor baby. They're like, we're all going to work together. No, some other actor is going to be the play- dad, someone's going to be the mom, and somebody's going to be the baby, and none of you people are going to be related. Yeah, well, my daughter put a quick end to that. At, at yeah, about she did not age care for two, it. she said, no thank you anymore, and would not go to any more auditions. Now she's eight years old. She's sort of, and actually she's nine years old now, and she's sort of coming around because she's starting to see some of her friends on TV in commercials. And you just, she was just in her production of The Sound of Music. Right, so now she's been on stage, and then she sees me in a couple of commercials and so now she's starting to think like well maybe but i'm like you know what alabama you don't want to do this you don't want to do it it's just miserable it's one of those things that you should yeah yeah, yeah your kid should be a doctor your kid should be a lawyer your kid should be well no, i don't care if she wants to be an actor but not not when she's a child i mean once she's 18 or 21 or whatever the hell you know then fair enough but not when she doesn't know any better you know, like now, when she would go on auditions... You're she, 50, you don't know any better. She thought that was a job. Like, she yeah. didn't understand the callback and the job. She thought the job was the audition, which essentially it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, she didn't... Yeah, she didn't... Yeah, rejection is hard enough. It's when you're a child and they're like, you're not quite as cute as the one staying next to you. Yeah. Bye bye And why are they so nice to me, Mommy? They're so nice to me, but they don't want me. You know? And you burst into tears. That's how I feel every day. That's my life. Why are they always going? You know, how is a kid going to understand the concept of the worst thing you want to hear at the end of you do an audition and the guy looks at you and he goes, great job. Yeah. Great job. That means fuck you. Yeah. That is Hollywood for fuck you, get out. Yeah, kind of. Unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, we've got a great storyteller here tonight, Margot Black. You know, she has a brand new book out, Han. It's called Where's My Award? What? And she's holding Where's it up right now. Where's My Award? It's a really sassy cover with a red carpet on it uh, because Margot does do PR for celebrities and she's a working mom in Hollywood. And she can cause people to get awards. And she has the power. She's I want trying an award. to do it all. She is doing it all. Much like Liz Lemon, she's going to do it all. That's she's right. She's going to have it all. But before Margot tells her story, I did want to remind you guys that if you'd like to support the story where the podcast we would so appreciate it we would you can pro- you can tell your friends about us that helps on instagram and on facebook just give them to follow us numbers numbers of us tell them we're on we're on itunes they can download it for free we have you know we have a a youtube page did you know that yes i did no yes, you didn't you didn't know that did you I assumed we had There's a, a few page. things up there. There's not enough. There's not enough. Do we we're have gonna, a Friendster page? We're going to beef that up. With yeah. Friendster, we're working on we, that. <laughs> I, we need a MySpace. I'll be in charge of the MySpace page. And, of course, you guys head on over to storyworthypodcast.com for all upcoming events, et cetera, et and cetera. never let us forget, they can buy your book, They can Pit buy my book, Pit to LAX, My Story Worthy Life. I like how you hold it up like those cameras here. All right, you guys, wherever you are, stick around because Margot Black is on her way Next time on Storyworthy, we have actress and writer Clementine Ford. And I'll be talking about real bodies and real issues. That's next time on Storyworthy.
Hello, people. It's Phil Rosenthal, and you're listening to Story Worthy. And we're back. We've left the Blasco Theater, and we're in Sardis right now. Truman Capote is at the next table. He's still alive, you know. <laughs> Man, you are just off the rocker with this one. I am all over. I'm gonna. I want to get letters about when were you at Sardis? I was at Sardis. Yeah, and didn't and didn't that guy die? Who was well, it? Who did you just mention? Truman Capote. Didn't Truman Capote die? Not only did he die, but one of the actors that the actor that won an Oscar playing him Phil- also died. Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? Yeah, yeah. That's so the bad. other guy who played him in a movie that no one saw is still alive. Talk, talk about an eccentric character, right? Truman yeah, he Capote. would have been a good guy to know, but it's like. When, you know, and it's sad. I remember people going, I can't believe Philip Seymour Hoffman died of a drug overdose. And it's it. I didn't write it down on Facebook because it sounds mean, but it's like I can completely believe that he died of a drug overdose. You know, if 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 he died climbing a mountain, that would have surprised me. Yeah. But a heroin overdose, no, or whatever it was. It's yeah. like that That does not – people are like, Charlie Sheen, do you believe he has HIV? Y- yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't can, believe I, that. I don't, yeah, I believe that. Scott Weiland passed away, you know, and the first thing I sent it to my, you know, my girlfriend Carolyn, and she wrote back, "I thought he did, you know, I thought he died of a drug overdose years ago." <laughs> no, right. He's and just kinda... uh, what I like is that I didn't, you know, I had no idea who he was. And people were like, "Oh my God, I can't believe Scott Weiland died," and I'm like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I have no idea who this guy is." Because you're 120, Hannes. I am 120. That's the you know why? No heroin, no mountains. I Ladies just sit gentlemen. quietly and I watch <laughs> Match Game 78. With Jean Rayburn. Jean Rayburn. All right, you guys. She's here right now, Margot Black. She's a comedian, a PR visionary, a trophy wife. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> a mom and now an author. Margot Black is the driving force behind Hollywood based boutique agency Black Ink PR. Black don't you Ink. like that? Yeah. I like that title, don't you? Black Ink. Black Ink PR and Marketing. And she's also the working mom creator of the acclaimed comedy memoir, Where's My Award? How to Get Baby Barf Out of a Red Carpet and Other Tales from a Working Mom in Hollywood. <laughs> you can find her at margotblack.com. You can also find her over at Twitter at Black Ink PR. All right, folks, wherever you are, put your hands together for Margot Black. Shortly after my kid turned four, Hollywood came knocking on our door. And when I say knocking, I mean Hollywood literally used the actual knocker on my actual front door. It was in the shape of a drop-dead gorgeous Hollywood actress named Golden Brooks, who just happened to live in my neighborhood. Her daughter, Dakota, was a year or two younger than my son, Jet, and we'd see each other now and then pushing strollers and enjoying our sunshine. I started a little group on my neighborhood of moms called Sippy Cup Socials, where neighborhood moms and I would meet after preschool, fill our sippy cups with liquor, and take our kids to the park. Don't arrest me, please. We did it in restaurants, too, and fill our sippy cup with margaritas. I know, super cool and honestly, very necessary for our sanity. Frankly, I needed a double sippy cup the first time I met Golden. She was wearing cut-off shorts, t-shirts, and flip-flops, and I tell you, without a scrap of makeup, she was freaking gorgeous. I would said to my star-stuck shelf, oh my God, this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen on planet Earth. And I mean Hollywood beautiful, the kind of beauty that comes from all over the planet to be the most beautiful woman in Hollywood. If you ever wanted to know if you're swimming in the shallow end of the DNA pool, this is the type of moment you know you are. Not just pretty cla- girl in class, pretty girl on planet beautiful. All right. And uh, it's brutal. You suck it up. You know, I am pretty girl's best friend for the rest of my life. Nevertheless, I'm the bigger person and accept her for who she is, and we become mom friends. But Golden is a woman who not only is a total and utter knockout, she's also cracked Hollywood. She's a top working actress. She was on Girlfriends for seven years before two seasons of Heart of Dixie and many other projects. She is not a newbie. She is not a waitress. She's a big deal, and she's really earning a good living in Hollywood doing a tough job. Hats off to her. So one day, I'm working at home, and the beautiful Golden... This time, without her daughter, Dakota, knocks unannounced on my front door. I'm working at my desk, and I can see her through the front window, so irritatingly enough, I have no time for liposuction or Botox or makeup before letting her in. (laughs) She sees my son, Jet, who's playing with his toy cars and bends down to say hi. And I think my son just bats his eyelashes at her, and I think for a moment, oh my God, is my four-year-old flirting with a Hollywood star? I'm kind of impressed by him. So... I can't imagine why she's there. And then Golden tells me she's been in a series of auditions for a pilot she's producing and acting in. And she says, you know, there's a little boy who's one of the leads. And every time I see a little boy come in the room and audition for the role, I think to myself, oh, I hope this little boy will be like Jet. Haven't found that little boy. So what do you think? Could it be Jet? 
For the first time in my life, I'm speechless. And before I can utter another word, she says, or a sound even, she says, it pays. Now, Miss Brooks has literally presented my precious cargo with a seemingly golden ticket to stardom. This is the kind of break people hope for all their lives. Just to put it in perspective, look at it this way. I've worked my entire life in Hollywood and nobody has ever, ever knocked on my door and offered me a role for anything. Nobody's ever offered me a job. But in fairness, I'm not as good looking as my kid. So I say, yes, 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 yes. I am grinning in a way that only Lindsay Lohan's parents could possibly understand. The lead, the lead. Oh my God, the starlet just offered my son a lead. I tell my husband, Rob, and he's also delighted. So she explains to us on the day of the shoot, Jet's task will be really simple. All he has to do is like wake up, pretend he's from a night, having a nightmare and scream, mommy, 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 which is perfect because my son's at the age he does it anyway. He's like jumping out of doors to scare me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I am counting dollars in my brain. I'm so excited. So the shoot, I'm thinking walk in the park. So I tell my husband and I'm literally... As I'm telling my husband, I can hear the sound of college funds, and I'm totally relieved. Oh, my God, we're going to pay for college. Our spawn is special. The lead, the lead. My son can go to Harvard, and I can go to Aruba. I am so excited. I pop a bottle of champagne in my brain, and then suddenly it occurs to me, I've left out one detail. Does our son, Jet, want to do it? And so I ask him, and quite clearly, he says no. Excuse me? He says, no filming, and he does not miss a beat. No, no, don't want to. And I think, okay. Please, because mommy wants an Hermes jacket. <laughs> and he says, he gives me a kiss, comes up and says, no filming, no thank you. And so being the good mom that I am, I say, okay, let's be curious, like Curious George. And we pack our body weight and snacks and go off to film. And I tell Golden, yes, sure, we'll do it. <laughs> and so here's the thing about my kid. It's not the first time in his life he's dipping his teeny tiny little perfect toes into the shark infested waters of Hollywood. He's actually had other jobs. And when he was a little baby, somebody came up and said, can he do something? We did it. It didn't work out well. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of effort to get a kid into a car, be pretty, not barf, be pristine. You know, hats off to the Olsen twins, mom. And just to let you know, the Olsen kids are twins. And as a little Hollywood side note, twins are far more valuable than single kids because they can be replaced. So, so on the day of Jet's shoot, we go and we go into Golden's home and they're shooting a bedroom scene. First of all, it is gorgeous. You could tell a decorator did this. Colors you can't even name the palette. There's crystals everywhere. It is like in Style Magazine. And then there's cameras everywhere. There's probably like a crew of 15. We meet people. We meet the directors. You know, tons of like craft services, everything. You can basically smell the money burning. So I say to my kid, oh, look, honey, licorice. And he takes a piece of licorice, looks around and goes, no filming, mama. No filming. And I'm like, Ah, he'll warm up to the idea. Have a little more candy. And so we go into the stage and we look around. Let's just be curious. Let's look. And so, you know, this is from a kid, first of all, who, remember, likes to frighten his mom. That's his only job on his set. And then we get in. I'm like, let's just give it a try, Jet. And he gets in and they go, action. And he just looks at the camera. The kid who will ham it up for your iPhone, ham it up for a camera, ham, ham, ham. Now, nada, nothing, zippo. 15 people are staring at him. We reset three or four more times. Resetting takes time. Resetting takes money. Did I mention the money? Literally, you might as well like have a guy at this point. We've been in the room for like an hour or two, shoving money into like the toilet bowl. And um, I'm starting to think, okay, this is not going so well. Not going so well. My kid is usually a great player, really loves to play along. And um, I tell him he's got to stay in the bed. He doesn't look really happy. I whisper some cool mom bribes to him in his ear, like happy meal, curious George toys, candy. You know, we try a couple more times and um, I start calculating their production budget in my head. I'm like, that camera's 10 grand, that dolly's 15 grand. I'm like adding it up in my head. And my kid is just sitting there. He eats another red vine. He asks for some juice. 15 people watch my kid under big light drink juice. <laughs> they call cut again. Finally, the director says, look, why don't we swap out the moms? You know, there's another mom. And why don't you do it? So suddenly, my spawn is so special. Just his good looks, he has resurrected my acting career. Now, the other mom, of course, who thought this was her big break, is visibly pissed. Yeah. A little sorry she paid for those Meisner classes now. But, you know, call us bad parents. We just beg them one more time, just this once. 
please do it. And I promise we'll never have to film again. No dice. We start offering extra sessions of Angry Birds at home. Yeah, I'm in show business for less than two hours and I'm sucking up to my own kid. Still no dice. It's his golden ticket into stardom. And I swear to my son, all that glitters is not, not gold. And he clearly has no interest. Okay. But at this point, the director, the other camera operators, I can see him, you know, just cursing in his head. It's not like I'm psychic, but I can hear the soundtrack and it's all profane. So then I look up. There's no backup kid. There's nothing. I'm mortified. The director just wants to kill me. And my husband starts bribing my kid again. Now he steps in. So my kid's Let's say three hours in showbiz, two bribing parents, and 15 people sucking up to him. Great. My stress levels are through the roof. Then I start thinking, oh, my God, these lights are so hot. I honestly, in this moment, completely understand how half of Hollywood is on crack. The pressure is intense. I want to have a drug addiction right now. And then I start thinking, oh, my God, are there child labor laws I'm breaking? What am I doing? After what seems like forever, we throw in the towel and leave the set with our heads hung low, low. Feeling like a failure as a stage mom, beautiful, golden, totally professional, serene, gorgeous. She's like, not a problem. I mean, so professional. We get home. First thing I do is inhale six giant sized Tootsie Rolls and a large glass of white wine. I know, totally mature. And I'm not one to like really, you know, kind of anxious eat, but I don't know what happened. My traumatic stint as a showbiz mom tipped me over the edge. It was less of a case, whatever happened to baby Jane and more of a case like how the hell did I get through that bottle so quickly? So we get into bed, and suddenly my son is his jubilant self again. He's happy. He's joyful. You know, we get into the tub, and, like, I'm washing him up, and, like, a couple hours later, I say, honey, why did you not want to do that so much? And he looks at me with so much love and his beautiful batting lashes, and he says, but mommy, I don't want to die and live in the TV. I want to stay here and live with you and daddy. And I think in a minute, oh, my God, I'm the biggest asshole (laughs) on planet Earth. So at this time, we weren't watching a lot of TV. It was like a steady diet of, you know, Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, Curious George. And my kid thinks that we were trying to sell him to live in the TV. That's how it works. Now, I don't have in this moment all the wherewithal. I want to cry. I want to hug him. I feel like the biggest failure in the world. I can't exactly explain all of creationism to him from like Pixar to, you know, how it all works. We take our phones. We show him in the TV. He's giggling. Then he's giggling in my phone. Then he's screaming in my phone. Okay, I can see my Bentley going. I can see Aruba going. I see my Hermes jacket going. And I think, oh, my goodness. He just had no idea. And I tell him, I'm never selling you to the TV. I'm never even letting you go. Even when you're married, we're going to follow you around forever. We were the biggest asshole stage parents ever. And uh, the good news is my son will never be in a true Hollywood story. Well, except for this one. I don't want to live in the TV. See, the funny thing is I want to live in the TV. I wanted to a long time ago. You understood it. You understood. If I could have moved into a TV, yeah. I but guess. this is a tiny baby. This yes, is a four-year-old, yes. and it's not like his mom or dad works in the industry. You know, like my daughter, Alabama, her father is a director, and he's, you know, he's on yes. sets all the time, and he walks around with, you know, duct tape. and Right, my son <laughs> had never... Light, a light meter. Right. He'd right. never really seen it by that point. Right. I mean, all we were doing so were watching movies. he didn't understand the production end of it. No, and I thought, oh my God, I've n- for the rest of my life now, I will always, from that moment, I realized, okay, you always have to put your self in your kid's shoes Mm -hmm. and that's what I didn't do because I was into this elixir of a cocktail Aruba Bentley College Fund Aruba Bentley College Fund I mean it is like a mesmerizing mantra a magical pot of gold well everybody every single uh, parent in LA whose whose kid goes out for an audition every single parent I've ever met they all say the same thing well it's just like for a college fund if they could just pull a couple of dollars together now but we're not like stage moms I mean we're not like stage parents we're not going to push them just so we can make it's just a little bit of money. That's, that's right. all. A little bit of college. And then you think, oh my God, that. I swear yeah. to God. Yes. And in that one afternoon, I swear, we went through every emotion from what mansion would, be, would we have in Bel Air to like how much money do we need to spend on couples therapy. But you can see it. You can see what a big slope it so is. So you thought he'd really be an actor from then on out? No. But, you know, somebody walks in your door and knocks on your door yeah. and says, you know, every time I see a kid, I hoped it was your kid. See, I think that, I, I think mean, the guy who's, you know, the other people are like, 
why? Yeah, I know she's producing and starring in it, but it's like, why did she just come up with a kid with no acting experience who's not a twin? Because yeah. like the kids on uh, the twins on Everybody Loves Raymond are actually triplets. Oh, no kidding. Because twins nice are to not. You gotta have a. You gotta have one a spare. who just took a nap. You need a spare. Right. That is the Hollywood inside secret. Everybody's a twin. But yeah, no, like we were personal. Fr- you know, we saw each other around the. No, block. I understand she that, but it kid. wasn't like her. F- her it was a professional thing so it was like she was really taking a risk there she was and you know she knew my kid and i'm sure if it had gone backwards and my kid didn't think i was selling him to live in the television for a moment (laughs) he probably would have been a lot better so does golden brooks still live down the street no she moved out of the neighborhood and um where'd she move to bel-air i don't know but Palisades. I, I really don't know where, yeah. but she's just such a beautiful, beautiful. I mean, when you're in the presence of that Hollywood beauty, you just know, man. Hannes can Hannes can talk about that. Yeah, the time I was a featured extra in The Aviator, and I was with with the guy playing Louis B. Mayer, uh, who with Kate Blanchett comes up. She's Catherine Hepburn. She comes up and talks to him. So she comes up directly towards me and is like a foot away, and you're like. <laughs> That it's like you can't even speak when She's people like are that good looking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When people are that like perfect Charlize looking, Theron is like that too. It is mesmerizing. Oh yeah, beauty. no, I've heard that, and it's not even about sex. I've heard that if I ever met George Clooney, I'd be like, I can't, I can't even talk. You're so because it, I think it has to do with they say that people are attractive because their faces are symmetrical. This is a theory mm-hmm. that like the reason that we consider a face to be handsome or gorgeous. It's because both of its sides are perfectly symmetrical. That's like which true is, Greek beauty or a Greek, yeah, Greek goddess. which is not the way most human beings are. So like uh, somebody like that, it doesn't, you just look at them and you're like, I can't even believe you exist. Exactly. And the funny thing is, you know, we all have to swallow like these little fibs that they tell other little children that might not be so gorgeous. Like, oh, it's the inside. Yes. Oh, it's personality. Oh, you're so special. But you're in the moment in front of it and you're like, Oh. However, I don't know. However, I've met some people that are so beautiful like that, and then they start talking, and it's just vacuous. You don't, yeah, but that wasn't out. this. But again, you know, for all that people, you know how hard Hollywood is, and it's like beating your head. So for yeah. somebody to walk up and knock on your door and yeah. say, would you like this part? That, like, never happens Do you know, do you know any, um, like, stage moms And like now that? we know why. <laughs> well, actually, you know, I mean, my stepsister has a son that's in – Hollywood, but she's got a lot more time to take him around, and it's another job. It's but a job for the mom. A, yeah. It's a full job for the mom. But do you think that she is like a stage mom? Like, does she push it? Does she really? I wanna... don't think so. I mean, yeah. I think he's. I'll see these happy these moms it, but... at at like an audition, like a commercial audition, and they have three kids with them. Only one of the kids is going to the audition. Yeah, right. The other two had to come along. So That's now hard. She has to set up like a little triage kindergarten area. Right. Yeah. Uh, with stuff to with do. With like stuff to do for all these kids who were just bored out of their minds. Yeah. But, I would have to drag Alabama around on auditions. Even if it she wasn't auditioning, I was auditioning. And you know, you're with a stroller and you got like there's a backpack it's and a hard. diaper bag. And then you get to an elevator and you can't get the stroller in or it's out of service and now you're climbing stairs. Oh, it's and awful. You're trying to look good all this yeah, while. That's the thing. And you're so stressed. And you're trying to yeah, maintain this dignity of like or this air of like, oh, this is no big deal. I do it all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's Easy a big peasy. fucking deal. It's a big deal. It's exhausting. I remember really being on the 10 freeway and my daughter vomiting in the car seat. You yeah. know, I'm on my way to an audition. Totally natural. She's vomiting in the car seat behind me and I'm on the 10. You can't, right. you can't do anything. Right. Right. Nightmare. And also the thing is that startled me the most is you see yourself sucking up to your kid so fast. Yeah. Because you're, you're embarrassed. It, right? No, it wasn't even that. I was just trying to get the job done. Like, I really yeah. realized, okay, this is a lot yeah, of no, money. So this no is a lot of work. This child is not... actors are so screwed up because That's it's like it. just the people are sucking up to them because they need to get done. You got to get done. You and they gotta think, gotta get oh, done. they must really like me. I don't care about you at all. You're a giant prop. Exactly. Just, I just say the words. This, right. Yeah, kids and animals are the hardest to work with, they say. Hmm. So listen, you have this new book out, Where's My Award? And this is one of the stories in the book? Yeah, and it's just really a big love letter to working moms. That's what the book is. It's a love letter to working moms. And I you love know that. it, Christine, because it is hard to be a working mom. It is. When you are pushing that stroller upstairs and you're trying to get it all done and you're trying to juggle. I don't think moms get enough kudos and celebration for all the work they do. And yeah. I think that everything that we look at in the magazines and a lot of media, it's just so fake. 
It, yeah. Well, now let me ask you something because mm-hmm. the the subtitle under the book is how to get baby barf out of a red carpet. Do you is there an experience about barf in a red carpet? Oh in this book? yes, there is. Can we hear about that? <laughs> I'll come back at another time and I'll tell you the entire story. Okay. Okay. Because did you take your does your son? Because this little boy on the cover actually looks like your son Jet. That's why we picked that picture. That's adorable. Mm. Do you, have you taken him to events like this? Oh yeah. And so what does he do when you go to a, what, what are you doing at the events? Because you're a PR person. Right. I've done all kinds of different things. He's pretty good. He's really good. He understands work. He understands uh, when it's time to work and that I am working. I think he's kind of, he's grown up. But as gears. a PR person, what do you do at a red carpet event? Because I don't think a lot of people understand how the red carpet even works. Like, for instance, the first time I actually was a part of a red carpet, like I didn't understand that you get corralled. Before you walk that carpet, you're kind of corralled in an area, mm-hmm. kind of going one at a time so that the people taking your picture know who's coming. Absolutely. And so then how they does need that to work? Get... Tell us about that. Well, it depends on all different types of ways. But there's so many different parts but let's just say you're doing a big debut and you want to show that there are people there each person has to be id'd the photographers need to know who's there you need to know what their story angles a are film premiere the information well i mean i do premiere? all kinds of different premieres so i do business premieres entrepreneur pre- premieres What's restaurant that mean? premieres What's a business pr- premiere so sometimes people are debuting a brand new business there's a lot of details that go into it you need to make sure your media is correct. Your photos are correct. People know where to go. That everything works when they go there. Stores work. Shopping carts work. The press is, uh, you know, ID ahead of time so that they have a heads up. It's not like you just have an event that day and yeah. call everybody and say, are you free to come down to my event? I mean, you're pre-calling So the specifically press. the red carpet, how does that work? Well, the red carpet, you first of all want to make sure you have good people on the carpet, right? You've what does it have mean, good people on the carpet? People that the photographers can make money from. So they need to sell their photos and then the magazines need to make sure they have something to work with. They need to be good dresses. They need to be looking up. They need to be people of interest. Look, you and I could walk down the red carpet but nobody needs us. Right. But you and I walk down the red carpet like, you know, George Clooney dragging us on his leg. We're on the cover can of Can you make us that magazine. happen, please? Is that possible? <laughs> I mean, can you spin your magic? Sure. You just give me George Clooney's cell phone you know, number and him. I'll get right I on it for George you, I saw George Clooney. Uh, excuse me. I saw George Clooney twice Mm -hmm. in three days. Wow. The first time at Dan Tana's restaurant, Mm -hmm. and we made a little eye contact. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh Uh-huh. Sure. Two, three days later, I shit you not, I'm in Studio City. I'm in a sushi restaurant. I walk in. Who's sitting there in the booth? George Clooney. And I kid you not, he did one of these. Watch this. He went, huh. (laughs) Like, he he raised his head (laughs) up at me. He He recognized me, and I was just like, I have to go to the bathroom now and be alone. It might take me two to three minutes. That's it. I would have gone up. See, in that moment, you got to go up and introduce yourself. Just well, say, hey, stranger in my universe. I mean, you know, I'm a stranger, but, but you're I not a stranger. I think that was somebody. his reaction to like, he didn't know who you were, and he didn't even know why he recognized you, but it was, you were still in his brain, like, I've seen that person before. Yeah. So I'm going to nod. He is beautiful, man. He's one of those people that just stops you in your tracks. Yeah, that's that's what I've always And Johnny said. Depp also st- stops oh, stop me in my tracks. gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Paul saw, Giamatti. Yeah. He'll stop you in your tracks. And the thing is, when you're asking me about the red carpet, I mean, that's why those people get paid so much because very few people can command that full on red carpet to cover of magazine celebrity that sells stuff. And that's, it changes that's what it comes all down to. the time. All the time. So all the you time. never know who's who's it, who's not it. You just it. reminded me of a story on the red carpet. When I, uh, years ago, I was going out with a girl for a very short period of time, happened to work at Universal. And they and it was the premiere of uh, the Lost World, the second Jurassic Park movie. Okay. So we get to go to it, and we're walking on the red carpet. She had very short cropped, bleach blonde hair, and looked vaguely like Susan Powder. Do you remember yeah, Susan sure. Powder? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I had this red Google. beard because it wasn't gray then, and I vaguely looked like Timothy Busfield. And we're walking down, and I can see in the photographer's eyes they're like taking pictures, and they have a look like, is that? <laughs> <laughs> who we don't is that somebody right they look like they might be somebody but we're not sure and then even if we think it's those two people does anyone want a picture of that you see all this calculation yeah. going on behind their eyes and eventually they're like we don't need to take a picture of you. right no. so what happens then the photographer takes the pictures and then they put them up on like it's called getty images is that what it's called it depends on how you're doing it and what you need for each client it's different but lots of times there's a deadline. So you need to get with a photographer. You need to sort through the images. They've got to go on a wire. You want your press release out. You want it to all hit the news. You want it fast. 
and you know you still have an event to manage. So There's you're so trying many to get it all out. Complicated things going on, Margo. You really have to multitask. You have to multitask, yeah. and you've, the thing is, you're doing a lot of digital work, and you're making sure you get the right photos, and you want everybody ID'd properly. You want your client. Let's say it's a film. You got to get the information in. And there. now all the tags have to be on, and all the everybody's right. everybody's social media stuff has to be on right. and current. And the the odd and strange and brilliant part of it all is like, let's say the carpet's not a big carpet. It's not a big thing, and you have to get the branding in the back. And you want everybody to look good. And the funny thing is, it's like such a small piece of like real estate in the universe, but it gets blasted out everywhere. And if it works and it's good and it's somebody that really can make, you know, any one of the people, Hollywood Reporter, anything like that, you're really able to move that message forward. Yeah. And it's a big deal. But, you know, everybody loves that red carpet, but I will tell you, it is made of blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. You really come at it from a, such a business angle, Margot. But a lot of people forget this is show business is not show fun. It's it a, is show business. And there's, there's a lot of business right down to you best have some red tape on the side of that so people don't trip on their heels. And the funny thing is, you know, people, women look gorgeous on the red carpet. Most of the time, they are standing there in killer pain because their shoes are like four inch shoes that they had to get from the car out to someplace you know it's not like they're wearing flip flops because they're going to yeah. be photographed and almost every celebrity i've ever seen on the red carpet is like oh my feet are killing and me. and then what happens so, when they come off the carpet i just want you to at think the other of end what happens at the other end they get off the carpet what then they usually go to whatever event they're going yeah, to but are they like jesus that was a bitch or do they take their shoes off or they no just... they can't take their shoes off no you absolutely can't you can't. You have to be at your event. So whatever you are, it's your job to look beautiful, to be there, to do it. They're yeah. very, very, very bright. I mean, most celebrities that are successful, they are exceptionally bright. They know the drill. You have to do the promo. Yeah. And the other thing is- You, you have, have to, to look, look the part. You have to look the part. You have to do it really well, and you've got to do it over and over and over again. Because when it is your time, it's your time repetitively for three days, like, you know, consistently from- nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock what do you night. mean by that if when you're your doing time. a press junket i see and so sometimes for press junkets you know let's say for like international press they come into a room let's say it's a julia roberts movie she's sitting there she has her talking points and she's in a hotel room like at the four seasons yeah. in beverly hills and, and they'll one let at in. a time no not Tell well me. one at a time maybe for the bigger press they'll get an interview like 10 minutes at a time for major uh the television shows but then for most of the other outlets like say let's say european media or some australian media they'll throw seven journalists in a room at a table for 20 minutes and those journalists have to get the story now let's say we're all sitting at a table together you me hans and six other people i got to get some questions in and i have to have a little bit of a different well, don't story they all than have you the do. same story no no you can't all so like the journalist is trying to jockey for a little information to get a little something so here Imagine yourself the celebrity. You have to tell a great tale about the job. Oh, this was like the best movie I ever worked on. How was on. it to work with George Clooney? Right. Oh, George Clooney is just so fabulous. And then everybody needs a little personal detail, a little work detail. And you just keep repeating a it. Little, exactly. A yeah. little bit about what's going on in your life. Yes, I love being a mom. Yes, I love working. Yes, I love my Prada shoes. You know, blah, 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 blah. And um, But you're doing it over and over and over again and you had best deliver <laughs> or you're out you're out now they'll be like yes was george clooney drunk on his press circuit because he had he'll yawn in the middle of one of these interviews where he's saying exactly the same thing over and over again right and like you said about they're trying to get something but it, it's reminding me it's funny because sports does the same thing yes but they're they'll be like live on espn and it's like they're like what information are you going to get you're not interviewing Castro one on one. Okay, he's dead. I'm a thousand years old. But it's like you're not going to get anything. You're not going to. But you got to give everybody everything. You no, no, no have I'm saying. To it, but give. the journalists themselves are like, what do they think they're going to make Julia Roberts say? She's not going to say something shocking or outrageous. Yeah, she's not going to tell you something. She's right. not going to. Yeah, she she'd that? be like, you know, oh, well, how was it being a mom? I tell you, I had postpartum depression. For like, she's not saying that yeah. to you. Well, here's the thing. It's all crafted. I mean, there's a publicist yeah. behind it. There are writers yeah. behind it. She's behind it. What's the difference between a publicist and a PR person? Same thing. They're the same thing. Same thing. So a p PR person is a public relations manager. If you have a publicist, you have the same thing. You have the same thing. PR, public relations. Sometimes people call me, call my PR gal. And did they bleed yeah. into social media or is that a separate category? No, it bleeds right in. I mean, now, when I first started doing public relations, I'd have, you know, a pad, a pen, and a recorder. 
and I'd go to a newspaper. There were probably like five newspapers, and every man had a girl, and I was somebody's girl. And uh, we'd all go to the newspaper, coordinator watches, and, you know, hand in the story. <laughs> None and of these words mean first. anything to anyone over under 20. No, but then, Pencil, you know, I came watch. back like 10 years later, took a break, came to Hollywood, worked in Hollywood, went back. Then it's like all women and gay men. And, uh, you know, did a little freelance PR, came back to Hollywood. Then I came back after I had a kid, went back to PR. And um, which is ironic that PR is easier than Hollywood yeah, <laughs> as far yeah. as like the rejection factor. And so then it's it's tons of women. But now you're expected to do everything. Write it, produce it, shoot it, edit it, get it out, uh, get it on the wire, get it on social right, media, right. get it everywhere. I mean, now it and also it's such intense amounts of writing now. Constant writing. I kind of miss the days. I feel like I missed a part of my career. Like, I should be in Mad Men, where it was like vodka, phone, and great dresses. Yeah. yeah. I could have done well then. But I still do well. But it's, you know, very writing. Well, now it's like if you take the example of, like, a reporter. It used to be that the reporter would get in a car, that somebody would drive with her, and there'd be a cameraman in the car, and they'd all drive to the location. And then the cameraman would shoot the girl, and there'd be, like, an assistant. And then they'd go back to the station. Somebody would edit for her, you know, edit the piece, and then they'd put it up. And now the girl drives herself to the gig. She turns around her iPhone on a selfie stick. Yeah. Shoots herself. Yep. Gets back in the car, takes it back to the studio, edits the piece, and hands it in. I would even say she uh, goes into her car, plugs in her laptop to her, charges her laptop on her car cell phone, yeah. mm -hmm. and edits it in the car and uses like a HubSpot from her cell phone and wires out her story as fast as she can wow. to beat everybody else. That uh -huh. is amazing. Yeah. I'd, it's I'd, really changed. Yeah. Uh, I remember also hearing about like um, the guys that do the traffic in the helicopter. So the uh -huh. guy is flying the helicopter. Mm -hmm. He has to talk with air traffic control in one ear. Mm -hmm. The other ear he's talking on the on the radio live and mm -hmm. telling the traffic situation below him mm -hmm. <laughs> as he's flying the helicopter. Right. So it's like a one-man band. Everything is one person. And if he's and doing it's... television, he's also got the camera. He controls the camera. Yeah. <laughs> right. And there are other people. <laughs> but, you know, like my client won an award last year, and it was a red carpet event. And so I pre-wrote the release. We went there, shot some pictures on the red carpet, and I, I edited the, the photos on my phone. I was like, excuse me, I'm just working, and I'm sitting there doing it. Then I go into the theater. I have it all ready, and then I see if my client does win or doesn't win. My client does win. Uh, my goes up, She goes up, accepts the award. I run out, and I put my release together, put my photo together, and shoot it on the wire. Wow. Done. Amazing. Here's my release. I social media it. Like, before the award show was done, yeah. my announcement was up. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah. Everything but, moves so quickly. That's why we all need so much content, because it's just moving so quickly. We yes. just chew through it. Chew through it. Ah, like yeah. a crazy dog, like a rabbit dog. Give hey. me content, content, content. Give it to me. And so if you want more content, you can use my shameless plug. Read my book, Where's My Award? It How really to Get Baby sweet. Barf Out of a Red Carpet and Other Tales from a Working Mom in Hollywood. It's really just a love letter to every working mom it's in planet. Really hey, can sweet. you buy that on Amazon? <gasps> Thank you, Hannes. You're my hero. You know what you can do? You can go to storyworthypodcast.com, uh, click on our Amazon link. Our and banner then we get ad, a and then taste. we get a little taste. Hey, listen, you want to play some it. Shotgun Storyworthy? Oh, yes, I do. That music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! I got California. All right, so I came from New York, and people always ask me, how'd you get to California? I didn't think about it a lot, but I was visiting my stepsister, Melissa, one day, and we were rollerblading, my first time ever. And I was on the beach, and I thought, oh, my God, it's so beautiful, the sun, the heat, the sand. I should have worn sunscreen. I should have worn shorts. Who knew? I was on rollerblades because of my 12-year-old niece at the time. And then she, I didn't know how to stop, so I rolled into a newspaper caddy. And I look down at the caddy, and it says, blizzard cripples east coast i feel the sun i look at the ocean and i said you know what i'm staying yeah. that's it i'm staying <laughs> and I, I just didn't come home it wasn't really well thought out it wasn't like a big like i'm looking for love in california i just thought that's it blizzard yeah. cripples new york i'm done i'm never digging my car out of the snow again hello california you're my new home there you go god bless you i agree i think a lot of people um find that 
California, you know, when it really clicks is when you're on the beach, either riding a bike or rollerblading. Oh, it was That's January. Like it, it was yeah. January. I left that part out. It was January, and I yeah. thought, this is California. But even if it was the middle of the summer, and it's like they're having a heat wave back there, any time of the year in California is going to be better than any other anywhere. time of year. Anywhere. Fuck the seasons. Fuck the fall and <laughs> It doesn't leaves. even matter. I know. People get over that real quick. They're like, don't you miss the seasons? No. no. What are you I just go about? Right. being kicked in the balls for three straight months <laughs> no. from December to no, no, don't. Three don't. months? It's like five months. And in Pittsburgh, it gets dark at like 3.30. So they're just like mole people, really. Yeah, and people are always like, well, what about the seasons? And I'm yeah. like, I go to the mall and watch the 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 clothes change in the windows. That's yeah, it. I can tell there's different seasons. <laughs> yes. I'm good. It's fine. Thank you so much for coming on the show, really. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for fantastic, having me. fantastic, and it's just a really great inside look at how Hollywood is a business, man. Oh, Hollywood's a business. It's show business, not show What do you think is more friend. powerful, uh, Wall Street or Hollywood? That's a Wall great Street. question. You know, Because they deal directly with the money, and where does Hollywood get its money? Wall, Wall Street. Street. So without Wall Street... There is no Hollywood. I don't know. I, I, I might even disagree because there's what? Wall Street. No, this no, is no. outrageous. I got to tell you why. Because Hollywood is what everybody is seeing. Yes, all the money's in Wall Street, but Hollywood is taking. I mean, I the amount of merchandise and intellectual property, everything that we sell is sold through television and a visual medium. And our world is so visual right yeah. now. Yeah. Everything you want is because you're seeing it. So, all right, uh, Hollywood. Just talk me into it. Hollywood, Hollywood, yeah, no, Hollywood. It's interesting. It's really interesting. All right, anyway, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. I want to thank everybody here at the Improv, including our new sound guy, Ben Stewart. Thanks, Ben. Yay, and of sound course, guy. Thanks, Ben. Every- oh, you screwed up again. Boop, Jesus. Boop, doo-doo. And of course, on behalf of everybody at Sideshow Network, including Sean Merrick and Roddy Swearingen, and of course, on behalf of John Thomas Griffith, you know, he wrote the theme song, Follow Me. He's so handsome. He is handsome. His face is completely symmetrical. He has one eye across his whole head. (laughs) That's how perfect. And on behalf of you, Margot Black, again, thank you so much for coming to the Improv to record with us today. My total delight. Thanks for having me. And on behalf of you, Hannes Finney, my dear friend and co-host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it the story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Four tires and get up to $250 in savings after rebate at Bell Tire's 4th of July sale. Or get even more in Bell Tire gift cards June 20th through July 2nd. Plus, get tires as low as $49 after rebate. Get up to $250 in savings. Or get even more in gift cards June 20th through July 2nd. Get up to $250 in savings. Choose the lowest tire price, period, at Bell Tire. 100 years of getting folks safely back on the road fast and affordably. See storebelltire.com for details. Restrictions apply. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Hi, it's Carl Deichler, CEO of Beachbody, and I'm giving away 10,000 free memberships a week to try our amazing Beachbody fitness and nutrition programs. Pick any program and just follow it step by step, like our 21-day fix program or the ab shredding muscle burns fat program. Plus, there's free support in personalized fitness groups with our community of over 2 million members. Now is the time, so don't wait. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great.